the average person eats more than one and a half times the amount of salt they should every single day, and that can put their risk of health complications really, really a lot higher than they would like. So what are some healthy salt substitutions? Let's find out from the doc. Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for watching and downloading in more than 150 countries around the world and making the exam room one of the most consumed nutrition podcasts anywhere on the planet today. And today, Dr. Neil Barnard is here with us talking salt substitutes. What are your best bets for kicking sodium to the curb without resorting and leaving your food tasting like... Well, nothing. So you drop the L and the N from bland, and that's what you get a lot of times. We don't want for that to happen. We want you to have some super tasty, super healthy food. So we're going to do that without all of the salt today. Dr. Barnard is going to be weighing in. And what about those salt substitutes that are sold in stores? Things like new salt. What's the skinny on them? We're going to find out. Maybe you've seen some things or two that you have a question about. So go ahead. Let's stuff the doctor's mailbag with all of your questions. If there's something you would like to ask, drop it in the comments or in the the chat. We're going to get to as many as we can here on the program today. Already have some questions from Jenny about vitamin B12 supplements and whether they can lead to a higher risk of hip fractures. Mike has a question about fasting and diabetes. Sam wants to know about side effects from weight loss drugs. And Jesse wants to know how your nutrient requirements might change as you get a little bit older. Do they change? Dr. Barnard's going to fill us in there as well. So maybe your question too. Go ahead, fill it right now comments chat doctor's mailbag you know the drill here how we like to raise our health iqs on the exam room live and with that let's talk salt and salt substitutes dr neil barnard welcome back to the show my friend great to be with you chuck you know salt is a big 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 issue in the standard american diet and now all around the world i know in china they're also looking at reducing the amount of sodium in people's diets um from your perspective how big of a problem are we facing here when it comes to excess sodium well when you look within america it's not the biggest problem we have the biggest problem that we have is the load of animal products we consume brings in a lot of fat and cholesterol so we end up with cardiovascular disease higher rates of cancer and so forth however um, salt is not a benign thing and it can raise your blood pressure and if your blood pressure is too high what are you looking at you're looking at a higher risk of stroke in particular so in asian countries they've been attuned to this for a long period of time because they've been using a lot more salt than we see in the United States. So yes, it's a problem. Uh, the problem that most of us think about is stroke. Um, and there's just no question about it. A high salt in intake brings you down that road. Is it true that actually having a lot of salt in your diet can harden your arteries as well? Well, when yes, when, when your salt intake goes up and your blood pressure goes up, the, the forces, the physical forces on the artery walls are higher. And so it's going to accelerate atherosclerosis too. And, and a high blood pressure, which is driven by salt, is one of the prime cardiac risk factors. Well, that doesn't sound like much fun at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. But that's the bad news, Chuck. The good news is there's something you can do about it. Well, let's talk about the things that we can do about it. Before we get to the salt substitutes, though, um, I, I also want to ask you about the difference between added salt uh, that we uh, use when we're cooking or maybe table salt uh, versus the salt that's found in processed food. Which is really the bigger problem in your eyes? The big problem is the hidden salt. It's the salt that, that came into your through your front door that, that had been added by the manufacturer before you ever got into cooking. That's the big problem. Now, sometimes people also add a huge amount of salt when they're preparing foods, but what is the, the salt that we often think of, but is not so important, is the salt you may add at the table. Very often that little sprinkle you put with the salt shaker is trivial compared to the amount that they added at the factory. All right, now let's talk about that table salt. And a lot of people are saying, well, hey, you know, the doctor told me I had high blood pressure. I wanted to do something about it. So I went to the store and I picked up some salt substitutes. We had an exam roomie by the name of Millie right in. And Millie said, well, I found this thing called new salt. And I'm wondering whether or not it's a healthier option. When it comes to things like new salt, and I believe that there are other companies out there that make similar products, what's your take on these? Yeah, uh, what you're talking about is instead of sodium chloride, which is table salt, you're talking about potassium chloride. And the good news is your body needs some potassium. 
And if you were to really overdo it with potassium, that's not good. But the amount in any common use of a potassium chloride salt substitute is fine and well within the bounds of safety. So bottom line gets a green light. All right. That is definitely good to know. And uh, there are, as a matter of fact, Morton's, one of the bigger salt manufacturers out there, um, makes something as well. I think a lot of exam roomies right now who are watching would be saying, well, now, wait a minute. Don't we need some of that table salt to make sure that we're getting enough iodine as well? Because that salt has been iodized. What are some healthier options there to make sure that we're still getting what we need in terms of iodine without the excess salt? Well, if you have maybe even a third of a teaspoon of uh, iodized salt every day, that's not going to raise your sodium to an enormous level. It's okay, and you're going to get iodine. However, you can do it without salt. You can do it, the, the number one for sure is sea vegetables. So you go to the sushi bar, and you get your, not fish sushi, but you get your cucumber roll or the asparagus roll, that nori wrapping. Uh, that's a seaweed that's really loaded with iodine in, from the natural source, the sea or you get a bowl of miso soup and the wakame that's in there, that's a seaweed. It's a really healthy source of, of uh, iodine as well. And some people will actually take kelp, kelp, uh, K-E-L-P uh, supplements, which have a healthy amount of iodine too. If your doctor says you need it, uh, that's a perfectly fine source, but seaweed comes top. You know, the last time that we talked about seaweed on the show, we had somebody write in after the fact, Dr. Barnard, and said, well, look, you know, I'm really, really, really cautious about this because my blood pressure has just been off the charts. Um, are there any other naturally uh, or any other natural foods that somebody who really is struggling with their blood pressure may want to avoid because they contain so much natural sodium? Well, if you if you look at the labels on any packaged food, you're going to see the sodium, and it's almost in almost invariably just something they added in, something they dumped in at the factory. It's it wasn't naturally in the foods. And if you look at plants, all the beans, all the vegetables, all the fruits, all the whole grains, none of them is high in sodium naturally. When you see it on the label, that's something the manufacturer added. All right. Now let's get to the good stuff. Let's talk about salt substitutes. We talked about new salt and potassium chloride, but what about some other options that might be out there? We're talking about five healthier alternatives here. Um, if you're going in the kitchen and you're looking to avoid salt, but you definitely want to make sure that your flu food is still tasting on point, what are some of the things that you're reaching for? Okay, well, number one, I think the one that you mentioned, potassium chloride is a perfectly fine choice. And I think of that as a literal salt substitute. Here's sodium chloride, here's potassium chloride. It tastes similar and it works fine. Uh, number two, though, is what I'm going to call a more flavorful, more flavorful kind of salt. For example, if you take a teaspoon of table salt, that's got, what, 2,000 or 2,300 milligrams of sodium. I mean, that's a lot. That's the, the, what you're going to get for the whole day in one teaspoon. What if instead you took soy sauce? Very high in sodium, too, but it's got, what, 300 milligrams instead of 2,000 or 2,300? So a little bit, bit of soy sauce might sound like a strange thing to put on top of your potato, but it works. Or you've seen Bragg liquid aminos. You spray that on your, your kale or spinach or on a potato. Uh, that's in the same ballpark, about 300 milligrams. Now, you might say, well, I can go a step down. I can go to a lower sodium soy sauce. And you can. That'll bring it from 300 down to 200. So you started out at more than 2,000 with table salt. With some of these more flavorful, salty foods, you get a lot of flavor, a whole lot less sodium. Now, for number three, let me say that we think about spices. Right next to the salt is pepper. Good start. Uh, but we can also think of all kinds of other spices that we might have on the shelf. Uh, into your spaghetti sauce could go a lot of salt, but also will go in oregano. Um, you can use rosemary and thyme, or if it's a Latin American theme, some cilantro. And so when we think about the herbs that bring out the flavors, you kind of don't miss the salt that didn't go in there. And then going away from herbs and spices, how about some natural foods that just are so flavorful? they really kind of kick the sodium out of the way. I'm thinking about some lemon juice that might go on a salad, but it can also go on vegetables as well. And then the onions and garlic, the whole um, allium family, the shallots and so forth, when they go into foods, suddenly the flavor just really just kicks in in such a good way. And finally, think of the vinegars. If you go to the store, yep, they got a bottle of white vinegar, but right next to it, they have 
two dozen different kinds of seasoned rice vinegar, balsamic vinegar, red wine vinegar, white wine vinegar. Try out all these different flavorings and they can go on a surprising range of salads and vegetables and things and can replace the salt. But my number five is nothing. When a person starts just leaving the salt out or reducing the amount without a replacement, something happens in your tongue, which is your tongue starts to become more sensitive and the desire for salt starts to decrease naturally. So at first foods are going to taste totally bland. They really are. But after about 14 days to 21 days, somewhere between two and three weeks, your taste buds adjust and they prefer that lower sodium flavor. So if you go back to using a lot of salt, you're gonna, your taste buds are gonna say, this is way too much. So you're giving your tastes a little, little bit of retraining there. And it's funny, I think that virtually everyone who's watching right now has already experienced that if they've ever gone on a diet, right? And you do so well for those two to three weeks, maybe two to three months even, but then you reintroduce something that you haven't had in a while. And at first it's kind of like, that is way too much salt or way too much sugar in there. And, and suddenly it's way saltier or sweeter than, than you previously remembered. But then taste buds are also kind of a funny thing, Dr. Barnard, in that they can also quickly revert back to how they were before you went on that diet. And they quickly get readjusted to sodium and sugar bombs on there. Um, why, why does the mind work quite like that when it comes to our taste? You know, we think of all of the nerves and brain cells as all being up here, but the tongue is a sense organ and those, the, the neurons connect to it and they are acutely attuned to what you are, are coming in contact with. Why? Because what you eat could be spoiled. Uh, what you eat could be some, in some way poisonous. So your brain invests a whole lot in the tongue being sensitive to these various tastes and it adjusts based on recent experience. So you've got a little computer in there that's adjusting. And I got to tell you, Chuck, um, when you were talking about the, our taste buds readjusting, um, I remembered when I was about 12 or 13, my mother walked into our house and said, everyone, we are no longer having whole milk in this house. And she decided we were all going to go to skim milk. This was her idea. That, that would be a, a healthier choice back at that time. And so at first, the, the skim milk tasted really um, just watery and it didn't even look right. It was kind of blue. Um, and we objected. But as time went on, that was all she bought. And so we, we got used to it. And then one day, maybe about a month later, she had accidentally bought some whole milk and she served that to us and we hated it. And it, it was just, it tasted like paint. And she said, oh my goodness, that's my mistake. But that's what you always ate. <laughs> you always thought that was fine. And now you don't want it anymore. It's like a smoker. When a smoker gets away from cigarettes for a couple of days, they're craving it. But then when they've gotten away, they just object to it so much. So salt is like that too. If you're used to putting salt on everything and then you back down on it, your taste buds will take a little while to catch up. But once they do, they don't want that high salt intake anymore. And that's a good thing to allow your, your neurological structure to forget some bad things. That's good. Is salt on its own addictive? Mishi Mishi at 1206 is wondering about that. Yeah, it sure is. Um, researchers have, have uh, looked at this and salt does increase dopamine levels in the brain. And that makes perfect sense because if you look in nature, it's hard to find a lot of high sodium foods. Um, you know, cows are given salt licks and things because there just isn't a lot of, of salt around. So our brains are highly attuned to it. And when they find it, they want it. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's, that's true. And where we also see this is if there's a combination of salt and fat, you know, what would that be? Well, a French fry, fat, salt, onion rings, potato chips, the salt fat mixtures are even more addicting. Oh yeah, man. It's funny the the salt and fat and then salt or, or and then uh, fat and sweet, you put either one of those two things together and it's just like, it kicks the brain into overdrive. I was always, assault guy and no surprise i think that that's a, a big part of the reason why i struggled so mightily when it came to fast food um we were talking about how much food uh, salt is added to pre-prepared food i mean is it even possible in your estimation to go to any sort of fast food restaurant and get something that is not just loaded up with it you're talking about the little apple slice 
<laughs> yeah, right. Um, I mean, Chuck, you said it. I mean, the fast food chains are there for a reason. I mean, their whole point is to pick you up by the ankles and shake the change out of your pockets. And so they do it with a, a lot of high salt foods. But on the other hand, the good thing they do is they do um, publish their nutrition information. You can look at this at the, the sodium content. You you know, the, the different different uh, fast food chains differ in um, how respectful they are of the public. But you know, you, you do get that fat salt combination and fat salt ketchup. Oh my God. You, you know what I'm talking about. People get hooked on those things. Oh, I mean, yeah. Cause then you've got the, the salt and the sweet, probably a little bit of fat in there with the oil too. It's it, that ketchup is not just tomatoes, my friend. Right. Um, I did not really realize until I kind of became a foodie in the plant-based world that there were so many different colors of salt out there. We've got pink salt. We've got black salt. We've got green salt. And somebody in the chat today is also wondering about gray salt. So when it comes to sodium levels, does it really matter what color the salt is or are they all kind of the same and we need to proceed with caution with these things? Uh, you said it, Chuck. They're really all about the same. Um, the colors are other minerals that are part of it when they harvested the salt, and it doesn't really affect the content very much. Um, but one thing to, to be aware of is that Himalayan salt might sound much more, you know, 2023 20, compared to Morton salt, but it may well not be iodized. So if that's your source of iodine, look for the look for the I word on the label. Speaking of iodine, have you heard of a connection between uh, people using cranberry juice to get adequate levels of iodine or not? Is well, that I, something? Wow, amazing, Chuck. I have not heard of that. Let me check that out and see if I could say something intelligent about it. No, I, I, had, <laughs> I, I, had, I had not heard of cranberries as being an iodine source. Yeah, I, I saw that today, too, and I was like, I, I, I've i never seen that. Like, I, are they adding it to the cranberry juice kind of the same way that they would calcium and vitamin D with the orange juice? I don't know. I've never seen that either, but I'd be interested in looking up the research. That's a cool thing about this space that you and I are in is that there's always something new to learn. I don't care how long you've been in it. There's always, always, always more stuff to learn and more research is still coming out. I mean, you've been in this field for however many years. Do you still get excited when new research and new topics cross your desk? It, it, you, what you said is exactly right. Um, the research is always growing. We're always finding out new things. And that's, that's uh, what makes it exciting. It's also what makes it powerful because there are some conditions where we thought food couldn't possibly play a role there, but it does. And that gives you new power. Um, let's kind of go the opposite direction of high blood pressure and talk about low blood pressure. Anne Marie at 1206 is wondering whether or not it may be a good idea to use a little bit of salt if you have low blood pressure and you're trying to ward off dizzy spells. Hmm. Well, the first thing it should be said is the one time where we see low blood pressure where it can be a problem and a person's got to take some action is the person who has in the past been treated for hypertension. The doctor put them on a drug to bring their blood pressure down, didn't quite get them there. The doctor adds another drug. The doctor might add a third drug and they finally get their blood pressure where it is. Then they come and they see us here at the Barnard Medical Center or somewhere else and they change their diet. They get on a low fat vegan diet and they're losing weight and their blood pressure, it comes down and down and down because of the diet. If they are still taking all of those medications, one day they're gonna be standing up from the table and suddenly they stood up a little too fast and they're getting really woozy. And that's because they're on all these medications pushing their blood pressure down. Now, when their blood pressure was kind of reaching normal anyway, what do you do? You don't throw your blood pressure medicines in the trash. Don't do that, that's dangerous. What you do is you talk with your doctor and say, I'm changing my diet in a big way. Will you monitor me and back me off on my medications when and if the time is right? And that, that's the most important time is to, to, to work with your doctor to jettison medicines that you no longer need. We see this with diabetes and blood sugar medicines. We also see it with antihypertensives. Um, if a person is exercising a lot, your blood pressure is going to come down. That's a good thing. And I'm all for it. Um, and typically, we don't see really dizzy spells. If you're really having dizzy spells at, uh, with some frequency, I would suggest seeing your doctor and trying to figure out uh, what, what is up because I doubt that, that adding a little sodium is going to really address the problem. That said, if you are getting very little sodium in your diet and you're having some as part of your food and it doesn't exceed 2 grams or 2.3 grams a day or something like that, go for it. It's no, certainly no, no risk with sodium intake at that level. 
Uh, we were talking about the different colors of salt earlier um, and how basically when it comes to sodium, they're all the same and it's just mineral differences that that give them the, the different look to them. But Patricia is wondering about sea salt in particular versus table salt. Is sea salt a healthier option in your opinion? Or again, is this really kind of the same thing? In my view, it's all marketing. Um, it sounds more natural, um, but it's it's really marketing. The difference here, again, is will it have iodine, iodine in it or not? In the past, the sea salts tended not to, but the manufacturers have caught up with us, and now you will see iodized sea salt. And, and if that's your source of iodine, that's, that's a good choice. Uh, here's something interesting from Bart. We were talking about taste buds adjusted. Bart at 1220 says, it took me over three years to adjust to salt, removing it from my diet, but now I can truly say that I no longer miss it. Three years. I mean, you want to talk about something that's got its hooks in somebody. I mean, three years, that is a heck of a long time. I wonder, and this is just spitballing. You probably don't know the answer, and that's okay because the research may not have even been done. But if somebody has really had that high dose, is there a dose response when it comes to things like sugar and salt and fat where the more you've ingested it for a longer period of time, the longer it takes for your body to get readjusted to not having so much of it? Chuck, what I, what I think we're really seeing isn't so much the fact that they were on a high dose before and it takes a long time to forget. It's really how often you rekindle it. So if a person is strictly low sodium or strictly low fat, then the, the, the taste buds do tend to forget it. But that one day you went out to Denny's and you decided to load up on salt all of your baked potato, that's all it takes to reignite it. And it kind of starts the clock back to zero. So in that case, it can take a long time. Yeah, and, and kind of along that vein, you've got Cecilia here at 1219. This is interesting. Uh, Cecilia says, I ate a cheese doodle the other day and about died over how salty it was. It was gross, she said. Now, here's here's what I, I wonder. It's like if you go, again, we were talking about this earlier. If, if you go, oh, you know, two months or so without eating something like that, and then you reintroduce it, the first time you taste it, it's going to be gross, right? But then there's something in your mind that's like, maybe that wasn't so bad after all. And then the next time you eat it, suddenly it's perfection again. And, and, and I think that that really kind of goes to how hard it can be for somebody to lose weight and maintain that weight loss. Um, I know that that's something that we work on a lot at, at the Barnard Medical Center. I know Dr. Vinita Rahman and, and our dietitian, Karen Smith, they got this wonderful weight loss program that they put together. I mean, what is the balance there between, you know, being able to indulge every now and again in a really salty food um, versus really not even risking that relapse and, and the chances that that could happen? I mean, from your perspective, what is the balance there? Does it differ person to person? You know, every, yeah, I think everybody is a bit different. It depends on the circumstances. It also depends on the degree of the health issues you had that are that are motivating you forward. But let's say you're at somebody else's house and they serve you something that it, you know seemed okay when you looked at it, but as time goes on, you realize it's full of grease or it's full of salt or something like that. You know, the typical response that we're, most of us are gonna have is we wanna be polite, but you just end up not eating very much of that uh, because for exactly the reason that you gave, it's gonna propel you down the wrong path. But, but Chuck, um, you mentioned that the, the question came in talking about cheese. And many people don't realize this. Cheese is right up there among the highest sodium foods. If you take 100 grams of cheese and 100 grams of, say, potato chips, you think the potato chips, wow, they're so salty. Cheddar, it's got a, way, a lot more salt than exactly the same weight of potato chips. And that is because um, at the cheese factory, as the milk is fermenting and, and the cheese flavor is coming out uh, in the product, they add a whole lot of salt, partly for flavor, but also partly to regulate the fermentation. It stops the fermentation from going too far. So if you were to send some cheddar, some brie, you name it, off to Vel Velveeta, for that matter, send it off to a laboratory, they would tell you it's got a phenomenal amount of sodium. A uh, two ounce serving of Velveeta has got about 800 milligrams of sodium in it. So hold on to your blood pressure. Uh, <laughs> you know, cheese has got to be the first thing you, you, you throw in the trash can, I got to tell you. So 
with the addictive angle there, we've got the fat, we've certainly got the salt, but then you throw the case of morphing in there right. as well. I mean, is that really, I mean, that trifecta there, is that what makes cheese one of the most addictive foods as well on the face of the earth? You know, Chuck, we see this over and over again in our research studies. When people go on a, a plant-based diet, totally vegan diet, they keep the oils low. What they'll say is, I feel so great. I'm losing weight. My numbers are better, but I miss and, and you could just fill in the blank, you know, they, they don't say they miss chicken wings. They don't say they miss mayo or something. It's always cheese. And I check, I think the reasons you gave are exactly it. It's the salt. It's the fattiness of it. And that salt fat combination, plus those darn casomorphins that are tickling the brain. Let's see if we can get Laura some help here. This one came in at 1219. Laura's trying to lose some weight. She says, what kinds of meals might be satiating for someone with a significant amount of weight to lose who has been relying on takeout for every meal and their daily sodium averages 15,000 to 20,000 milligrams? Hello. I'm wondering where all that sodium, that is a phenomenally high sodium intake. Um, I would look at the packages that you're, you're, you're getting. It's, it's hard to, hard to imagine where all that would come from. But anyway, the, we're talking about several different issues here. Um, first of all, what's the healthiest way to lose weight? It's not to try to starve it off. And it's certainly not to avoid carbohydrate. These are popular things people do, but they don't really work very well over the long run. The way to lose weight is the four food groups that we've talked about here. And you know what these are fruits and vegetables, and the bean group or the legume group, beans, peas, lentils, um, and also the grains, especially whole grains. If that's what, if those are the, the pieces that make up your diet, whether it's your spaghetti marinara sauce, or it's a bean burrito or a veggie chili or whatever it is, typically people lose weight automatically. Why? Because the foods are high in fiber and fiber has almost no calories. They're high in complex carbohydrate, which has only four calories in a gram. Um, and so you lose weight naturally. And the filling part is the fiber and the healthy complex carbs. And if you're at the same time, keeping the oily foods really low, your, your weight's going to come down. And that is going to be true, whether you limit your sodium or you don't limit your sodium. That said, if you're actually getting 15,000 milligrams of sodium per day, that is way beyond what is a healthy level. Um, that's going to drive your blood pressure up. You're going to be holding a lot of water weight also, and you're going to feel more comfortable and a lot healthier if you're able to bring that back down. So my target is about 2,000, 2,300, something like that, milligrams of sodium per day. Yeah, that level, that territory is about what I was at when I was at my heaviest. And um, each trip to the drive through was more than 10,000 milligrams. So my heart definitely goes out here to Laura. Um, and I would say just hang in there. If that is where you are at with your diet, um, it's not going to be easy to make a change. But by goodness gracious, um, it is doable. So hang in there and uh, trust that the first few weeks could be a little bit rough, but once you get over that hump, I'm telling you, it is so much sweeter and definitely go with the advice that Dr. Barnard was just saying there, fill up on fiber instead of sodium, and you're going to be in a much, much, much better place. Um, I'm glad that the question about weight loss came up because we have Sam who saw our episode on weight loss drugs a few years ago, well, a few years ago, a few weeks ago, and was wondering if we could talk a little bit more about the side effects that come from things like Ozempic and Wigovi, which are all the rage right now. We're really hearing a lot about the upside, but what are some of the long-term and even short-term side effects that people should be on the lookout for with these things as well? Sure. Great question. Um, when people are, are prescribed these injections, um, if they start taking them, it's very, very common to have digestive side effects, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. For some people that settles down and goes away. For others, it doesn't. And people just say, life is not worth living if I have to be injecting this drug that turns my digestive tract into a, you know, a real problem. Um, beyond that, we see pancre uh, pancreatitis can occur. Um, there was a French study that found higher rates of thyroid cancer, substantially higher, 50, 60% higher rates of thyroid cancer among users compared to non-users of drugs in this class. But then the, the other thing, apart from these physical effects, what you're, you're buying into if you're taking Wagovi or Ozempic, it's sort of like subscribing to an appetite control program. It 
if, if let's say you're in the obese range now and you start taking it, most people stay obese, but they're, they're lower down in that range. Doesn't get you to goal. And if it's like a subscription in, in that if you stop taking it because you say, I can't afford $15,000 a year for this medication anymore. I mean, if you stop taking it, the weight typically comes back. So you're just paying over and over and over again to control your, your appetite. So the cost is something to really be thinking about as well. So what we have found in our research and many others have found as well, that if you just skip these and focus on a healthy diet, now everybody's focused on diets, starvation diets, low carbohydrate, hydrate diets, Mediterranean diets, all kinds of stuff. And they feel, well, that didn't work for me. So it must be genetic. I should take Wagovi. Stop. That's like saying I had pneumonia and I took you know, some other medication for it, but it wasn't actually an antibiotic. It's not going to work for you. What is the treatment that will help people lose weight? It's getting the animal products off your plate, keeping the oils really low and having your foods as natural as possible. For almost everybody, that reduces your appetite, it increases your calorie burn, and it brings your weight down and there's no expense to it. Your, your foods are going to be cheaper than what you're buying now. So there's never a reason why you think I can't afford this anymore. And if I stop, my weight's going to come back. Uh, it becomes just a new quality of your diet that keeps you in a much slimmer range. Our friend, Sarah Frazier, uh, who used to be on Fox five in the Washington DC area and was on the radio here for a long time as well. She recently talked about this on her podcast and she's like, well, look, you know, when it comes to these weight loss drugs, here's another thing that isn't really being talked about is that as soon as people go off of these medications, guess what? The weight tends to come back. And is it really realistic to think for somebody who's in their 30s who begins this treatment uh, to be on it for the next half century or longer? That to me seems like an awful long time to be taking injections like this, Dr. Bronner. And people are talking about even earlier ages. The American Academy of Pediatrics very famously and in, very, in a very controversial way said, we should start this earlier. You're 12, you're 13, you're 14. Let's start injecting you at that age. And I have to say, I object to this on a, for a couple of reasons. One is those kids need, number one, to be in a household where food is, preserved, is pr provided in a healthy way. Very often the parents have weight issues too. And they're, they're well-meaning, loving parents, but they haven't had the information that, that, that is talked about here on the exam room. They haven't heard about and haven't been supported in following a healthy plant-based diet that could get them to goal. If you take a 12-year-old kid and you put her on Wagovi or Ozempic and you're saying, well, for the rest of your life, for the next six, seven, eight decades of your life expectancy, you got to fork out this kind of money for this and put up with the, with the gradually increasing risk of side effects. I say, stop. Let's look at what the cause is. And the cause is almost invariably food choices that people have come to embrace, not realizing how unhealthy they, they can be. By the, by the way, Chuck, let, the, one, one other thing should be said, um, and that is Novo Nordisk, which makes these two drugs, Wagovi and Ozempic, pays doctors in the United States about $25 million per year. Let me, let me say that again. Novo Nordisk pays $25 million or more. In 2021, it was $27 million to doctors in this country. Now, it's illegal to pay a doctor to prescribe a drug, but it is not illegal to pay the doctor an honorarium for talking to their medical school about how good these drugs are or going on 60 Minutes and saying, gee, I really think everybody should be taking Wagovi because your problem is all genetic. Um, the company is taking, th there may be rare occasions where you need these injectables. They are expanding from that into market share to try to just extract money from uh, insurance companies and from Medicare, um, which it hopes will eventually uh, cover these medications, which currently it doesn't. So it, it's, a, it's, in my view, um, a perversion of what a pharmaceutical, co pharmaceutical company should be doing, which is making drugs for people who actually need them. And let's also talk about uh, the cost associated with this really quickly before we get back into the doctor's mailbag. I did some numbers there while you were talking, and uh, the average cost of the drug per month without insurance is somewhere in the ballpark of $1,600. And so if somebody is, say, 30, and they go on this for, uh, they stay on it, as we said, for uh, 50 years, virtually the rest of their entire life. That is close to $1 million 
that will be spent on these weight loss drugs. And I don't think that you need Tony Okamoto from Plant Based on a Budget or any one of our programs here, Food for Life, any one of them to tell you that you could eat uh, a healthy diet for way less than a million dollars, Dr. Barnard. Well, yes, I think you're absolutely right. And if, if a person is at a decision-making point, do I take the Wagovi or do I follow a healthier diet? The first thing is, the Novo Nordisk will say, well, of course you should take the Wagovi along with a healthy diet, but they don't really give you much guidance as to what that is. And the practitioners who prescribe it, by and large, are not experts in how to use a vegan diet either. So they don't give good advice. And the person just thinks, well, I'll just take the Wagovi and I'll continue to eat whatever I'm eating. Those foods that they're eating set them up not just for weight issues. Remember, the Wagovi doesn't get you to your healthy weight. They also set you up for cardiovascular disease higher rates of cancer and other things. So you're ejecting Wagovi in addition to the lisinopril that you're taking for your blood pressure, uh, the metformin and so forth that you're also taking for your uh, diabetes and, and so forth. All right, let's go ahead and grab a couple of more questions. And then we've got a couple of big, exciting announcements about some fun events that are coming up. Um, number one, uh, Johnny Utah. How's your point break there? That was a good movie. Johnny Utah at 1223, going back to salt that we were talking about earlier. If I eat zero processed foods, am I okay not adding any additional salt to my food to still get the necessary amount of sodium that I need to function properly? Yes. I, you, don't, you don't need to be adding uh, sodium to a degree. Now, your question is a sophisticated one because you do need a little bit of sodium per day in, in your diet, um, but you'll get those traces naturally in foods. But if you want to add a little bit of sodium, it's, okay. it's, it's fine to do. And that'll be, um, as we said earlier, it'll be an iodine source for you as well. Pete, how much fat should we be eating every single day? Well, let's say you are consuming, oh, maybe about a 1800 calorie a day diet, which would be average for a, a, a sedentary adult, then let's say 10% of your calories are from fat. That would be 180. There are nine calories in every gram. So that's about 20 grams of fat. So what we come to is if you're having 20 grams of fat per day, maybe 30, if you're a little more active, something like that, that's a really low fat diet, but it's more than enough of the fats that your body does need. So that would be my target. All right. And let's grab a question here from Jesse. This is one that I think a lot of us should probably pay attention to as the years roll by. Jesse is wondering, what nutrients do you need more of as you grow into your senior years? The nutrient you need more of as you grow into your senior years, Chuck, is exercise. <laughs> <laughs> that is it. It's, it's really not foods because here's what happens. And when people get older, um, very often... They get more and more and more sedentary. And I don't mean just you're not that's on the track team, but it's you find yourself driving instead of walking places. Um, if your spouse or partner is, is uh, sedentary too, people really tend to get very physically kind of quiet. When that happens, what happens? Um, first of all, your bones don't have a reason to live anymore. So you're at higher risk for bone thinning and fracture. But um, apart from, uh, 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 um, in, in addition to that, you're really running at a higher risk for all kinds of cardiovascular issues that where exercise could help. Your appetite is down, so your nutrient intake overall is not very high. You say, okay, I'll get a little more exercise. What am I going to do? What I suggest you do if you're totally sedentary is go out and take a 10-minute walk, brisk walk, and then next week, 15, next week, 20. Do this three times a week. Once you're up to about a 40-minute brisk walk three times a week, what you will discover is that little bit of exercise increases your appetite. You're going to eat a little bit more. And so your overall nutrition, assuming that you're choosing healthy foods, will be better. So if you're sedentary, you don't have any appetite, you're not eating foods, and you're not getting the nutrition you need. Um, if you're physically active, you're going to work up an appetite. You'll eat those healthy vegetables and fruits and get the nutrition that you need. Well played. Let's talk about uh, a vitamin that is not necessarily found in a lot of plant-based foods unless it has been added, and that is vitamin B12. Ginny wrote in, concerned that uh, she had actually seen a study that linked vitamin B12 with an increased risk for hip fractures. Uh, what do we know about the connection there? Yeah, uh, an interesting study actually came out from Harvard and, and, and had the findings that you're describing. Uh, first of all, we should say clearly, you need vitamin B12. And people should be supplementing vitamin B12 um, because you need it for healthy nerves and healthy blood. 
If you don't get it, you can have nerve damage, you can be anemic, and the nerve damage can be irreversible. So don't fool around with it. If you're on a vegan diet, which I recommend, you should be taking supplemental B12. Um, if you pick up a cereal box or some other foods, you'll sometimes see some B12 added, sometimes to soy milk, but it's, it's not really a reliable source in that you might not be getting the full amount that you need from day to day. Okay, that said, the amount you need is really small. 2.4 micrograms is the RDA for an adult. So you go down to the health food store and you look at the B12 labels and you think, I need one that has 2.4 micrograms. You know what? I'm not going to find it. And you'll find 100, 200, 500, 1,000, 2,000 micrograms. The Harvard researchers looked at people who are getting overdoses of B6 and B12, both vitamins, vitamin B6 and vitamin B12. They found in both cases that if you're getting the amount your body needs, no problem. But if you're really overdosing, you can increase your risk of a hip fracture. The reasons why are not clear, but the finding was fairly, uh, fairly uniform. So what am I suggesting? You do need to supplement. If you're supplementing 100, 200, 500 micrograms per day, I think you're fine. I think those are in the safe range, but beyond that's probably too high. All right, and uh, let's go ahead and wrap up with a very interesting one from Mommy Vegan Nummy, our old friend with the fun name. 1218, is there a way to get the salt out of your body if you've ingested too much of it by accident or by choice? Is it possible to just flush the salt immediately by drinking a ton of water? What do you think there, Dr. Barnard? Leave it alone. It'll find its own way out. <laughs> okay. do, do, do stay hydrated. Um, but, but no, don't drink a gallon of water hoping that you're going to flush it out. It'll it'll find its way. Don't push it. All right. If we didn't get to your question today, have no fear. We will save it and do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. And Dr. Barnard, my friend, we are about to have ourselves a big takeover of New York. We've got two huge events coming up that way, starting with... This is very exciting. You've dusted off the guitar. You've been back in the studio. You and your band Carbon Works have a new album out, and you will be up in New York City at the Robin Williams Center for Entertainment and Media on May 9th. You got to be excited about that. Look at you with the guitar there. Okay, I see. You go ahead. <laughs> it's it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, you know, in, in our work here at the Physicians Committee, we, we do research studies and commentaries and intellectual things, but there is a time where you sort of have to touch the heart and that's what images will do and that's what music will, will do. So May 9th, we're gonna be in New York at the Robin Williams. Everybody remembers Robin Williams, what a wonderful comedian and actor. The Robin Williams Entertainment and Media Center. Um, we've got the, we're taking the place over uh, May 9th and we're gonna be showing you all the latest Carbon, uh, Carbon Works videos. We're gonna be talking about compassion and what that can mean and uh, Dolce, will be there with us. She was last year in 2016 and sang at the Carbon Works event then. She'll be back with us and it's gonna be just wonderful. She's uh, Italian and French, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yeah, yeah, she grew up in a little village in Italy, right at the French border. And she's, she sings on the Carbon Works, both records. And, um, and we'll all, by the way, we're also gonna be in Washington, right here in Washington, DC, May 11th at the American Film Institute. And uh, if people go to our website, they'll be able to, to get tickets. And I hope people will come. I think they're going to really enjoy it. That's it. PCRM.org slash events is the website. Or we've got links to both events directly right now for you in the show description or in the episode notes. But then, flash forward to July... We had so much fun out in LA. It's finally time to announce all the details for the big exam room live and in person in New York. You and I and our special guests, Dr. Barnard, will be at the Museum of the City of New York up there on Fifth Avenue and 103rd over by Central Park. We are going to be there the night of July 12th. Tickets are on sale now pcrm.org slash events or again click that link that is in the show description man just can't wait to be up there um can't announce the guests just yet but we've got some feelers out there that are going to knock your socks off so really hope to see you there la was such a blast new york is another top market for the exam room and i just can't wait for this show 
I got to tell you, Chuck, that L.A. party that you threw was I, have, I haven't had so much fun in my life. And what a crowd. It was huge and everybody had a blast. So I can't wait to be doing that in New York on July 12th with you. Absolutely. Sold sold the place out in L.A. I expect New York to be much the same. So today is a good day to get your tickets. PCRM.org slash events or click that link right now in the show description. And Dr. Barnard, of course, today's episode of The Exam Room Live has been powered by the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial. Fund. You know, we talk about them all the time, and it's because there's such tremendous, tremendous people over there led by Allison Mahoney. The Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund supports organizations just like the Physicians Committee that carry on Greg's love for animals by promoting plant-based health and working to end animal abuse while emphasizing programs that promote systemic change and also benefit people. And you can visit them online right now to learn more. Sign up for their newsletter by visiting them at GregoryRyderFund.com. Org. That's Gregory Ryder, spelled R-E-I-T-E-R, fund.org. You see that on the screen. Go ahead and give that a click and sign up, get their information. I mean, they're doing such tremendous work, helping the animals, helping to benefit people, promoting plant-based health, something that we are all extremely passionate about here on the exam room and at the Physicians Committee. And I know that you and Allison you guys just get along like two peas in a pod for a very, very, very significant reason, my friend. Well, you know, Greg had such uh, a warm and compassionate spirit, and and Allison has carried that forward so beautifully, and and is really making the world such a better place. So, thank you, Allison. All right, and thank you to you, Doctor Barnard, for raising our health IQs when it comes to salt and everything else today, my friend. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Chuck. And to the crew behind the scenes for making the magic happen, thank you as always. And to you, Exam Roomies, thank you so very much for stuffing the mailbag with all of your fantastic questions. And on behalf of everybody here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We will talk to you again very soon. But until then, keep it plant-based. <laughs>